Okay, apologies for the slightly shorter tea break than usual, but in the interest of time, let's get started with the second lecture. Uh, today, Jeffrey will tell us how to use Spectre to run parallel executables. Okay, so today uh, I'm going to continue uh, where we left off yesterday, going through the discontinuous Gulliken derivation. So let me remind you what this was all about. So discontinuous, I guess I should spell it once, discontinuous you Galerkin methods. All right, so what's the deal with discontinuous Galerkin methods? Like we talked about yesterday, we have some ingredients and uh, one ingredient we have is a system of differential equations. So I'll write that again. The system of differential equations we have, we've reduced everything to first order form. So we have partial T of U alpha, and we have then plus, uh, sorry, I just got lost in my notes here, plus partial I F I alpha, plus B I alpha beta, partial I U beta, minus S alpha, and that whole thing is equal to zero. So what are all these terms? So these are the time derivatives. This is the flux term we talked about yesterday. If you have a conservation law style equation, like you do when you're doing hydrodynamics, then you'll have terms like this. These are the non-conservative terms. Non-conservative. And, and for instance, when we did the scalar wave equation yesterday and reduced it to first order form, we found that it necessarily has terms like this. The scalar wave cannot be written in a form where it's just a bunch of conservation laws. There's these extra, extra, here, I'll make that I a little clearer, extra derivative, derivatives, um, extra terms that are proportional to gradients of some of the variables. And then this is a source term. Now the source term, the B and the F, they are allowed to depend on the variables U alpha, but not their derivatives. I've written this in a form where the derivatives are shown explicitly because like Harold was saying in the last lecture, the structure of the highest order derivatives, which here are first order derivatives, determines what kind of equation you have and what happens. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to numerically solve this equation. And the strategy we're going to use is spatial discretization. The idea is we're going to do some approximation to turn all of these spatial derivatives into, uh, into something that uh, we're, we're gonna evaluate them numerically. So that in the end, all we're going to have left are time derivatives and then we can use methods of ordinary differential equations to solve the system. So the goal for today is to show how the discontinuous Galerkin approach gets you from here to something that only involves time derivatives. Now we're gonna imagine like yesterday that we've got some domain and that domain doesn't have to be a sphere, but just to make it easy, we'll imagine we start out with a sphere and we divide it into six parts. I'm showing four here, and then you gotta imagine one in the front and one in the back. And then you could imagine refining that. And so you've divided the sphere up into a bunch of hexahedral elements. So each one of these elements here, like here's an element, each one of these is a deformed cube. So let's call this element the kth element. So we'll call that omega k element. Okay, so we've got ourselves an element. And then the last bit of ingredients that we're gonna need is we're going to need to talk about um, how we get these deformed elements and how they're related to some reference cube where we define our basis functions on. So you can imagine having an element that's some kind of deformed sphere. It doesn't have to be shaped exactly like this, and I'm not drawing it very well. Uh, 
I'm not drawing it very well anyway, but you've got some kind of deformed cube and the coordinates on this deformed cube we'll call xi. And in particular, there's some origin and then we'll have x, we'll have y, do I wanna do it that way, let's see, x, yeah, x, y, and z. And then there's some kind of mapping that gets you there from a reference cube where all the coordinates go from minus one to one, it's just a cube. And so this is psi and eta, and we'll make zeta going up. And so we'll call those coordinates psi i. Um, and I think I'm probably gonna put a bar, uh, a breathe on the logical, this is called the logical coordinates. So all these elements begin as a cube, minus one, where each dimension goes from minus one to one. So this is where we sort of left off last time. And we'll call this map, just how does each coordinate over here, uh, xi, I believe, get mapped into a coordinate xi over here. Okay, so I just wanted to have these things up on the board so I can refer to them. Those are the ingredients. And now the next thing I want to do is, oh, there's one more thing we need. We need basis functions. So we're going to introduce a set of basis functions. Oh, and I think I'm not using briefs here. I think I'm gonna use lines for those indices to tell the difference between the two frames. And then the basis functions, I'm gonna have some number of those. And those you can think of as functions of of the logical coordinates psi i, but also because they're related to each other, you could think of those as functions of the coordinates over here as well. And the idea is you can expand everything, including say your variables. So we'll say u alpha is equal to a sum. And in principle, in theory, you could do this to infinity, but we'll just start at some finite value, and then we'll say u, uh, we'll call this u i breathe times each of the basis functions, and each of them depends on words. All right, so this is the idea of the expansion, just like in the spectral methods that Harold's been talking about, but um, we're gonna go through a specific way of using this expansion to to discretize the problem's spatial dependence. We're gonna take each element and get rid of all these spatial derivatives. Now, I haven't yet said how we're going to do that. It's sort of a, it's like a five step process or something like that. But before we get started with that, does anyone have any questions right now about anything that we've been doing with the discontinuous Galerkin derivation so far? Yes. I'm missing an index. Where? Here? I mean, I have a U alpha here. Which, which one do you mean? This, this one has an index. Um, oh, this is gonna, so, oh yeah, because each U alpha is gonna need its own alpha, alpha as well. So is that what you're saying? Because there's, there's a bunch of U's. Um, Is that what you meant that, that you wanted to label this one? Okay. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you can expand each U alpha over the basis functions and their coefficients will be different. So yeah, I should probably label those by an alpha as well as by the, sorry, that's getting a little messy in there, as well as by the I breed. Okay, any other questions? As I've been saying, if anything looks wrong, looks like it doesn't make sense, um, or you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. There's no such thing as a dumb question. Now, I briefly yesterday at the end of the lecture alluded to what we're gonna do for a starting point. So in the discontinuous Galerkin method, as in finite element methods, the first thing we're going to do is take our system of equations, multiply, by one of our basis functions and then integrate over the 
integrate over the element. So this is going to be element omega k, which I've sort of hinted is one of the elements in our domain. And then this is the, just the space that, that we want to solve the equations on. So let's go ahead and start out with that. So step one is multiply by a basis function and integrate. Right, let's see how that looks. So we've got an integral and it's a volume integral and that volume integral goes over the element and we're going to do um, and then we're going to multiply one of our basis functions and I'm not going to write its dependence on space anymore but just remember this depends on space and then we'll multiply that by partial t u alpha plus the flux term partial i f i alpha plus the non-conservative term b i alpha beta partial beta uh, partial i, sorry, u beta minus the source term. And that whole thing, and, uh, yeah, and so this whole thing had better be equal to zero because the thing in the parentheses is equal to zero. All right, so this is where we left it last time. Okay, so why are we doing this? Well, one reason, one benefit of integrating over the volume will turn out to be that you can do integration by parts to turn some of these terms into surface integrals. And then that will be a natural way of handling what happens on the boundary of this surface. So if the element is omega k, then I'm gonna call the boundary of omega k, I'm going to call that partial omega k and that just that symbol is just going to mean the boundary okay so let's see here so we've got a volume integral of a bunch of different terms here one of these four terms if you think about it could be turned into a surface integral. And the question is, which one? Now I have, so there's some theorem in calculus that lets you do this. So let's call this term A, this term B, this term C, and this term D, just for the vote we're about to have. And my question to you is, which one of these terms could you use some theorem from vector calculus to turn into a surface integral? So let's think about that for a bit. Then we'll vote. Yes. The purpose of doing the integration is to use orthogonality properties, right? Eventually, orthogonality properties will come in, but not exactly because um, this mapping. I mean, we'll get there. This is like the very end of the derivation you're skipping ahead to, but basically that mapping is going to mean there will be some Jacobian terms so that your integrals aren't gonna just be orthogonal necessarily. Uh, they might be in some cases, uh, but I'll come back to that later. It's a great question. You're looking ahead. So just, just we'll hold, hold on that until later. Would anyone like any more time to think about this before we vote? That's always okay. If not, prepare your votes and hold up your votes. Okay. Okay, great, thank you. Put your votes down. What is the correct answer to this question? What's the correct answer? It's B, exactly so, because this is a divergence. And there's a theorem from vector calculus that the inter volume integral of a divergence can be rewritten as a surface integral. This is like Gauss's law, right? Like in E and M. So let's go ahead and do step two. And step two has two parts. This is the integrate. Uh, This is the this is the integrate by this is the integrate by parts step. All right. 
So if this phi weren't here, this divergence would be the term that you can integrate and turn into a surface integral. And that's still gonna end up working out sort of, but there's gonna be another term because of, of this. So basically there's some kind of product rule thing that's gonna happen. So let's see what happens in step number two. So we're gonna rewrite this integral, but we're gonna take this term out separately and then manipulate it. So we'll start out just doing d cubed x. And most of these terms are gonna stay the same. Partial t u alpha. Well, that term will stay the same. We're gonna take out the flux, flux term for now. So now we'll go to the non-conservative term, b i alpha beta times the gradient i u beta. And just to remind you, anytime an index is repeated in any of these things, it's summed over. So this i integral is summed over, the index is summed over, the b betas are summed over, i's are x, y, or z, the betas are, you know, however many equations you have. All right, so that's that. And then we add to that, um, then we add to that the volume integral, and this is over the element. We add to that the volume integral over the element d cubed x of the flux term. So I'm just gonna pull that flux term out over here. So there's a basis function, all right, phi i, then there's the divergence, f i alpha. Okay, and now what we can do when you integrate by parts, what that does in this case, when you've got a volume integral is first, you pull this derivative onto the other term at the cost of a minus sign, and then you get the surface integral from the, the total divergence. So this just comes from the, the product rule. The idea is partial I of the whole thing, F I alpha, phi I breathe, that's gonna be equal to the term we have, F I alpha phi I breathe plus the derivative the other way, uh, derivative on the basis function times F I alpha. So the idea is here's the product rule. So this is the term we have. This is the term we want. We would like to move the derivative over here so if I bring this to the other side, it'll pick up a minus sign. So that means that this integral here ends up, ends up this, ends up being equal to two terms. And the first term is going to be minus the volume integral, omega k, d cubed x, of the derivative acting on the basis function, phi i, like that, okay. And then that whole thing is just multiplied by the flux, but now without a derivative. But when you do that, then there's necessarily, there's the other term, the total derivative term. So we're just replacing this by the total derivative minus the derivative the other way. So now there's gonna be another term, the total derivative, and the integral of a total divergence is a surface integral. So now this is going to be a surface integral over the boundary of omega k, surface integral over the boundary of omega k. So this is gonna be an area integral, we'll call that d squared x, and it's over the entire boundary. So it's a, a shell integral. And then this is not gonna have any derivatives at all, there's a unit normal. When you do this surface integral, there's a unit normal vector. And then you'll just have F I alpha by I breathe. Try to tuck this wire in a little bit. It's almost yanking the mic off. So the first part of step two here, we haven't really done anything except replace this term in here with two other terms by using the product rule. So, and when a product rule happens under an integral, that's just integration by parts. So, so far, nothing's changed. Before we go on to the next step, does anybody have any questions so far? Okay. 
if we're all good, then this is where the discontinuous Galerkin method sort of departs from other things like finite elements or whatever, where you've done some kind of integration like this. And the idea is, let me get a good color here for this. Look at, look at this term right here. We're going to do something with this. And the idea is we're going to replace that this, this term that just comes from the equations. So this would just be the value on the surface of the element of the normal component of the flux. We're going to replace this with a numerical flux. So this becomes a numerical flux instead, which I'm going to call G alpha. And G, the I's are summed over, so there's only the alpha index here. And this G alpha is allowed to depend on a few things. It's allowed to depend on NIFI, and it's allowed to depend on, so it's allowed to depend on that, and it's allowed to just depend on the variables, U alpha, and it's allowed, and then I've left some spaces here. We'll come back to that. This is an integral on the boundary. So we need, to, so I need to say some things about what's going on on the boundary. So let me draw, let me draw right here, the situation we have with the boundary. So let's imagine we have an element and I'm just gonna draw them as squares, um, like they're in the logical point of view, but, uh, but you know, there's a mapping. So these are really deformed cubes or something, but let's just imagine an element omega K and it's neighboring element. So here's its neighboring elements. So this might be omega K plus one or something. And what I, I'm going to introduce some terminology here. And the terminology is the element that we're integrating over, I'm going to call, I'm going to call the space inside it the interior or int, but that means interior. And over here, everything that comes from the neighbor, I'm going to call the exterior. And so then here is the boundary. Now, in real life, these domains are touching each other, but I've sort of slid them apart a bit so you can see conceptually the differences. So there's the thing we're integrating over, omega k. There's a boundary between that and its neighbors. And of course, when you do the surface integral, you actually have to add up the terms from all the faces with all the neighbors, but we're just going to draw one here just so you've got the idea. So there's the interior and the exterior. And the reason I made a big deal about that is because, let's say... Let's say this U alpha is measure is the value of U alpha on the interior. And this is the value of NI on the interior, FI on the interior. How do I want to do that? Yeah. So interior comma I, I guess is how I'll do it. And then you're also, uh, this numerical flux, is it just taking data from the thing you're integrating over anymore? Now you're also going to put in terms potentially from the neighbor, from the exterior, and I exterior, F exterior, I. Okay, so this is allowed to depend on not only this flux, but also some combination of the variables from both sides. What is going on with this? Why, why are you doing this? So there's an interior and there's an exterior. So this idea is sort of where the discontinuous and discontinuous Galerkin methods comes from. Normally, uh, if you're doing some kind of spectral expansion and you're doing something like this, you want the solution to be smooth and in a, maybe in a more traditional uh, spectral method, you might, want, you might want to make sure that, well, how do I want to say this? I guess what I want to say is you want, you normally would imagine that everything is continuous across the boundary, but in discontinuous Galerkin methods, you don't require that the variables U alpha are necessarily the same in the neighboring element as they are here. They're allowed to be discontinuous. Yes. I'm sorry. Can you say it one more time? Right. So 
this is a surface integral over the boundary of the element we're integrating over. That element has neighbors on all of the different sides. Um, unless you're like on an exterior boundary, we're not gonna worry about that for now. And so I'm just showing one of them, but in reality, you have to picture there's one here, there's one in front, one behind, one on all the different sides. And when you do the surface integral, you'll do it six times, one for each face, and then add them up. And I just showed one just because it was easier to draw. And for each face, so there would be another neighbor down here and another boundary down here. And for each one, the thing you're actually, the integrand is allowed to depend not only on what's happening in the element you're integrating over, but also the values that are on the neighbor on the other side of the boundary. Now, you might think if I take, say, the variables u alpha exterior that are in here and evaluate them right on the boundary, and I take the variables u alpha interior and evaluate them right on the boundary, that those would necessarily be exactly the same because I'm evaluating them at the same place. But the discontinuous and discontinuous Galerkin says that these are allowed to not be exactly equal as long as their difference converges away when you, as, with increasing resolution. So if you get better and better spatial discretization, more and more terms in your series expansion, then these will approach each other. And in the limit of infinite resolution, they really will be the same. But this term is introduced, instead of just using the value from the interior, we introduce some combination of the values from either side. I'll say what this G is um, much later. But the point now is just that this G is introduced as a way to make use of information on both sides of the boundary. They are not allowed to be, and they are allowed to be different. Now in the limit that if the interior side quantities are equal to all the exterior quantities. So in the continuum limit where they really are exactly the same, in that case, then this G alpha just goes back to the thing you started with, Ni, Fi, alpha. It doesn't matter to say int or ext anymore because in the limit that they're the same, this G is not gonna add anything. But if they're different, then this controls what happens at the boundaries to make sure, and basically this is here to make sure that whatever might be flowing into the element from the neighbor is the same as what's flowing out of the neighboring element. So there's some kind of like conservation of, of flow. Like if something leaves one element, it enters the other and vice versa. And when these are allowed to be discontinuous, this term here is going to enforce that, that, that what leaves one element enters the other. And that's an important enough idea Maybe I'll even write that down. What leaves one element enters the neighbor, the neighboring element, and vice versa. Okay. So this is the departure from just manipulate, integrating and manipulating it. Now we're going to replace this term with a G. Yes. Yeah, so if the values u int and u x are the same, this is what I was trying to say here, then this g reduces back to as if I hadn't replaced the original thing, and then you haven't really done anything different. The only time this g is different is if they're not the same on either side. I'm sorry, can you use the microphone, please? So I'm saying that if the two neighborhood boxes have the same resolution, okay, numerically, then this numerical G alpha or the U, U alpha INT and U alpha EXT will be equal, or then they also be, they can be different. So numerically, the values on either side can be different, but I'm still not quite sure I understand. Uh, what does it due to the different resolutions you are choosing for different boxes or? Even if the resolutions are the same, the values can be different. Like the value of the U alphas, the, the variables could be different, even if the resolutions are the same. But the resolutions don't necessarily have to be the same on either side. Okay, so even if the resolution is same, then what causing them to be different? So if the, even if the resolution is the same, 
the value of one of my variables, like say if I'm doing the scalar wave equation, the value of the G might not be exactly the same on this side of the boundary as this side. They differ by something amounting to numerical error. In the limit of infinite resolution, they're the same, but at finite resolution, they're allowed to be different, even if there's the same number of grid points on either side. Is that what you're asking? Mm, I see. Okay, thank you. Uh, what's the set of a gradient that will lead to stuff flowing across the boundary if they're different? Yeah, you, it will lead to things flowing across the boundary, and then this term ensures that whatever leaves this element flows into the neighbor and vice versa. And this term is here to, to, to control that and make sure that you don't, because, uh, uh, but that's fine. As long as it converges away, that's fine. Now these discontinuities aren't necessarily big. I mean, you want them to be small and they're eventually gonna be infinitely small if you go to infinite resolution. This is not something that would handle a real sharp feature where like the surface of a star, something where it's really largely discontinuous. For that, these kinds of methods don't work very well, but just like because of the Gibbs phenomenon and stuff that, that Harold was talking about. But, it, but it's allowed, they're not enforced to be exactly numerically the same. The difference converges away, it's numerical error. Yes. Suppose uh, so in reality, can we imagine this? So, suppose the black hole is activating matter and uh, it is continuously activating matter, and at some point uh, the discontinuity arises that you are talking about. So, yeah, if I understand the question, there's sort of two different kinds of discontinuities. So there's the kind that converges away with resolution and there's the kind that's physical. So you talked about accreting matter onto a black hole. So, uh, but here's an even starker example. So imagine you just have a neutron star, right? Then it has a surface and very, very sharply, it goes from the density being non-zero to the matter density being zero. So that's a shock. And, the, and shocks are a discontinuity that is physical and you want to resolve that sharp feature. But then this, this kind of discontinuity that I'm allowing here, this is numerical because it converges away as you turn up the resolution. So I'm glad you asked about that. I really appreciate these, these questions because I really should have better emphasized the difference. We're allowing things to not be exactly the same in the, but in, at the limit of infinite resolution, they should be. These methods, this discontinuous Galerkin approach does not work well when you have a physical discontinuity where things, or, or even a sharp feature where things are changing very, very quickly. But this kind of thing, this is just, it's, it, the disc, discontinuity is just caused by finite resolution and it will go away if you turn up the resolution to infinity. Okay? Yes. Yeah, so you're not really going to do infinite resolution in real life. But yes, infinite resolution means capital N goes to infinity. And that's going to turn out to mean, yes, you have infinitely many grid points. So in real life, but in real life, you don't have to drive it to infinity. You just have to drive it enough that those little discontinuities are, I mean, it's numerical error, but you drove the numerical error as low as you needed for your application, I guess. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Uh, like, uh, it's like this reminds me of the finite difference method. You're taking like, each box and each box you're using the uh, spectral method for solving. Yeah. And then, in some sense, like the finite difference method, like each box is related to the other box. There is a connection with finite difference, but there's also an important difference. So, in finite differencing for comparison, I'll just draw a little finite differencing grid here. FD stands for finite differencing. And here are the grid points. So in finite differencing, usually you think of it as a bunch of grid points. You could think of each grid point as like an element with one point in it, I guess, if you wanted to. Um, but the point is in finite differencing, if you wanna get an accurate spatial derivative, you don't just like, let's say this is the kth point. You don't just look at its nearest neighbors. You would look at additional elements farther away if you wanna think of these as like, elements with one point each, you would have a wide stencil to get a high order spatial derivative. Whereas in this approach here, um, we're only ever going to ex communicate any information between the element we're thinking about and its nearest neighbors. 
And that's an important distinction because by only needing uh, to communicate with nearest neighbors, that reduces communication cost when you have a bunch of elements over a bazillion processors, because then each element at least only has to talk to the ones relatively nearby. Whereas in a finite differencing scheme, if you compare, if you do these wide stencils, then this element's not just gonna have to talk to its neighbors, it's gonna have to talk to other elements farther away. And if you have enough elements or enough grid points in the finite differencing way of thinking about it and enough spread out over enough processors, the network traffic becomes prohibitive in that case. So there is a connection, but, um, but here the emphasis is it's only the nearest neighbor. Uh, I mean, the discontinuous Galerkin method is distinct from finite differencing. It, the communication never extends beyond the nearest neighbor. All I meant to say was you could imagine finite differencing in some sense you know, you have one, you just have grid points, but you could imagine each grid point belongs to some element, but there are no other points in it, just conceptually. But no, the methods are distinct. Um, discontinuous Galerkin methods and the pseudo-spectral methods that Harold's been talking about, the spectral methods, those are not so distinct. They both involve series expansions. They're actually, they're actually not exactly distinct method, methods. There's, there's some differences between what a spectral code would do and what a DG code would do, but you can understand them as like different aspects along a continuum of the same kind of method. But that's not, I wouldn't say that's true for finite differencing. There's some things that they have in common, but, but there are some real differences like the one I'm emphasizing about communication. Yes. Yeah. Oh, what a wonderful question. So let me say a little bit more about how come, what about DG and shocks? So I said, it doesn't work very well for that. So does that mean you can't do this for black holes and neutron stars? Well, when we started writing Spectre, like um, this, it's the, the ideas for it started back in 2012 and the code we started writing sometime later um, in the mid 2010s, um, we knew that the literature had some shock capturing uh, ideas for discontinuous Galerkin. And at the time we thought that, okay, we'll use those and then DG will be able to handle matter. The, DG, the code that we're using Spectre is designed specifically because we want more accurate simulations with matter. So we definitely don't want to write a code that can't do it. And yet when we actually tried those discontinuous Galerkin shock capturing ideas that were in the literature on, on you know, the standard suite of test problems like a blast wave and you know, whatever, you know, the things that every new MHD code does to, to check itself out, they didn't work very well. And the only thing that we found that works well for shock capturing is finite differencing. So what Spectre actually does is should there be a sharp feature present in an element, like maybe this element here has a shock, then what it will do is it will, it will interpolate that element. It'll take that element and send it into a, into a finite difference, a bit of a finite difference element instead, and do finite differencing with the usual shock capturing that works well. But everywhere where there aren't shocks, then we stick with the discontinuous Galerkin method. There can still be matter there as long as there aren't any shocks. And then we benefit from the rapid convergence that, that Harold's been emphasizing. So that's a wonderful question. And in real life, we fall back to finite differencing when there's a physical shock. But uh, it's, it's still mostly a DG code. Most elements are still, where there aren't shocks, they're all still using DG, but that's right. We do use finite differencing when there are shocks because those shock capturing methods for DG that were proposed, we found they just didn't work well when we tried them. Uh, it wasn't me, I shouldn't say we. Um, it was, uh, I think, uh, uh, one of the postdocs at, at Caltech, uh, Jordan uh, Moxon wrote a paper about, about this. Um, they, they just didn't work very well. Other questions? Okay. Um, what I meant to say about flux from interior to exterior, what I meant to say was anything flowing from the neighbor into the element that had better equal, the amount that flows into this element had better equal the amount that leaves its neighboring element. So there's some continuity in the sense of whatever leaves this element enters this one, 
but I'm not enforcing that the values of the variables are the same on either side. But if something's flowing from one side to the other, then whatever leaves this one enters this one and whatever leaves this one enters the neighbor and vice versa. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, so now what we have is we have a, a volume integral of most of the terms plus a surface integral involving the flux term, which we've replaced with this thing. This thing is called the new G is called the numerical flux. So this G is the, let me use a different color so you can actually, this can stand out. This G is the numerical flux. Now, there's one other thing we have to worry about at this stage. Um, um, so that's what I wanted to do with stage step two. Step three has to do with this. Suppose we're doing the scalar wave and all these fluxes we've set to zero because all the derivatives we put into the non-conservative terms, right? You still have to worry about whatever leaves one element enters the other. You still have some information flowing but it's not characterized by a flux. It's what controls the flow of information is, is something called, so the flow of information, for the, the non-conservative parts of this are controlled by something called the characteristic fields. The characteristic fields, I'm gonna abbreviate that because that's a long thing to make you wait for me to try to write. And we want to have this same idea I was saying here for these flux terms for the information in the non-conservative terms. Basically, we want to make sure that whatever information is going out of this, this element in the neighbor into the element is um, uh, whatever leaves this one enters this one and vice versa. So if the variables are discontinuous, you will, uh, you know, in a way that converges away, but still you will, you will also need some kind of boundary internal boundary condition to take care of information flowing from one side to the other. And basically you want some, not continuity of the variables necessarily, but any, any outgoing characteristic fields on this side had better be incoming characteristic fields on this side that are the same. Oh, there was one more thing I wanted to draw here. I talked about these normal vectors. These are unit normals to the boundary. So where's my arm going? So here is a unit normal vector and I'll call that ni int, this is the one on the element. And then over here, this is the unit normal vector on the exterior. And I drew them with different lengths because if the, I exaggerated it, but if the variables, like if you're doing GR, the space-time metric um, is different on either side, then the normals might be different on either side, just in a way that converges away. And in the derivation that I'm doing, I'm assuming that the normals on the, each element and its neighbor point in the same direction. That's why I drew them pointing the same way. Harold, uh, no, he didn't allude to this yet, but there's another thing sort of like, you know, the N minus one business that he was talking about. There's another issue where there's a sign to keep track of which way these normal vectors to the elements are pointing. In, and in, in practice in the code, we usually always make the normals point outwards. And then there's some extra minus signs that I don't want to worry about right now. So I'm going to stick with this convention. Yeah, so in, for the scalar wave, I don't think the lengths, it makes sense for the lengths to be different, but these are unit normal vectors. So you have to normalize them. And if you're doing general relativity, you normalize them with the spatial metric. And if the spatial metric differs on either side, by a small amount that would converge away, then the normal vector can the unit normal vector can too, because you're normalizing it with a different metric. <clears throat> yeah, they're close. And as you turn up the resolution, they get closer, but they're not exactly the same. You mean the directions are different or the magnitude is I meant the magnitudes are different. The directions are meant to be the same here. They're both they're both pointing to the right on my drawing. I mean, you could do this from both points of view. It's just, you could start out like this and then transform both of these and the normals would point in different ways, but, but you, could, you could think of it either way. Now, it's just a choice here that I'm calling the normals pointing in the same direction. You could do this whole derivation where the normals point in opposite directions, but then there would just be some different signs in some places. 
it has a magnitude of one, but how you get that magnitude of one depends on your measure of distance. And, and that's the metric. And if the metric is allowed to be discontinuous, then numerically the components of your normal vector might be different. Okay, maybe the length is still one in the sense that it's a unit vector, but numerically the components of that normal vector will not be the same on either side of the boundary. And that's what I meant to indicate there because the thing that you're normalizing the normal width is different. Yeah, the components are different means that it is a different direction. Right. Its magnitude is one, but there's just a components are different. That means there's a slight difference in the direction. Well, the direction is always perpendicular to the surface. Yeah. But numerically, they're they're allowed to not be exactly the same. So you start out with something that is, you know, one zero zero. And then you normalize that by doing a dot product and you'll get a different magnitude to divide by depending on what the metric is. That's all. Anyway, that's just to justify why I'm writing ni int and ni x. So you start out, if you wanna make a normal vector, you would start out by saying, if like this is the x direction maybe, then you would start out by saying, okay, an unnormalized normal vector might have components like this. And then the way, and so we could call this like n prime vector. And then the way that you normalize it is you dot it with itself and the dot product uses the metric. And so that's where the difference comes in because when you compute the magnitude that you have to divide by n prime dot n prime, that's equal to g i j n prime i n prime j. And if that g is different on either side of the boundary, then this thing, which you divide the one zero zero by is different on either side. So it's not that the direction is different, it's just that the numerical value of the components to actually make the magnitude one with the spatial metric on either side is different. Does that make sense? No, but okay. Oh, okay, maybe we can talk more about it afterwards then. Okay. Let's move on. I wanna talk about what we do to control the flow of information in terms of these characteristic fields across the boundary with um, across the boundary for the non-conservative terms. Uh, we'll deal with what the characteristic fields are later on. For now, I'm just gonna stay, step three is we're going to, oh, I think I wanna go back to white shot for this. Step three, we're going to add another correction for the non-conservative terms, a non-conservative, boundary correction. So we're gonna call that boundary correction D alpha. And D alpha is allowed to depend on um, Ni int B I alpha beta interior. The same thing for the exterior, exterior B I exterior alpha beta new alpha interior new alpha exterior okay so i haven't said what the value of this thing is either but this is just some function that satisfies that there's a some function that depends on these things and it's going to have the same restriction on it which is as the G. So if the interior and the exterior sides are the same, then in this case, since this term isn't even there, otherwise D alpha goes to zero. And there's also the idea that if you switch the interior and the exterior, that D alpha goes to minus D alpha. So that's just saying whatever is entering one element is going to leave the other and vice versa. That's the minus sign means, you know, if one element gains some, something, then the other one loses it. So it has similar properties to this G. This G has this idea that if you switch the interior and the exterior, whatever is leaving one is entering the other. And that's the same here. And also like with the G alpha in the continuum limit, this D alpha reduces to what you had before you even entered these numerical 
boundary terms, boundary corrections, which in this case is zero for the non-conservative terms. I'll say what actual form they use later on. All right. So if we recap, if we recap where we're at, then we've got ourselves something we could think about discretizing. So zero is equal to the integral over the element of the volume element times the basis function, which depends on space, times partial T U alpha plus partial I F I alpha. No, no, I was copying from the wrong place. There's, we moved the partial I away. There's just um, the B plus B I alpha beta partial I U beta. Okay, so that's that term minus the source term. Okay, so that's this term here, and then it's gonna be plus, and then it's gonna be um, minus this term plus the boundary term. So then we're gonna have minus a volume integral omega K over the element d cubed X minus to the d cubed X. And now we're gonna have a term with derivatives on the basis functions instead of on the flux plus a boundary term. And this boundary term is over the entire boundary of the element. So I'll call that partial omega K. There's an area element d 2 X times a normal vector. But um, I've absorbed the normal vector from the area element into my definitions of D and G. So then this is just going to be G alpha plus D alpha times the basis function. So there's still this basis function sitting next to the G. And then to that G, we add a correction that will go to zero in infinite resolution limit, but that controls the flow of information for the non-conservative terms. Okay. So this right here is called the weak form of the, di of the discontinuous, uh, discontinuous, this is the weak form of the equations. Now, there's another thing you can do. You can, yes, if this is called a weak form, there's gotta be a strong form somewhere. And the way you get the strong form is you take this and integrate this term by parts so that the derivative moves back onto the flux and you can put that back into this volume integral. So, so this is an integral over the interior, over the, the volume. And you could imagine, um, you could imagine doing an integration by parts there to uh, move it back. So step four is if you want the strong form, integrate by parts again, or you might say undo the integration by parts, move the derivative back from the basis function to the, to the flux. So if we do that, then what's gonna happen? Then this integral right here is gonna end up being the original thing we started with, the basis function times, times positive divergence of the flux. So we're gonna have zero equals integral, we'll make a K, d cubed x, basis function, and now we're gonna have time derivatives of the fields. Now the flux term is back because when we integrate by parts, the derivative moves over here and the sign flips. So it's plus again, and it's plus the divergence of the flux. And now we still have the B, B I alpha beta. So we still have that contracted into partial I, the derivatives of the fields minus the source terms. And now this integral just turned back into the flux integral. So I put it back into this term, but when you do integration by parts, there's a surface term. There's, a, there's the total derivative term, the same logic we used before. And so now when we write the surface term over the boundary, partial omega K d squared X, now there's actually gonna be three terms in here. So there's going to be, there's going to be the G alpha, and there's going to be this boundary correction for the non-conservative terms, but now there's going to be, you know, the product of, the, of all of the basis functions and the flux and the normal vector from the surface integral. 
the, the total derivative term. So there's going to be an Ni times Fi alpha. And all of these terms are going to be multiplied by the basis functions. And this index I grieve is going to label which basis function you've got. And now I'm going to explicitly say, since these boundary terms involve things on the interior or the exterior, since this integral was taken over the omega k, over the element itself, the interior, these terms here, when you undo the integration by parts, are evaluated in the element itself, in the interior, not in the neighbor. So this is called the strong form. Okay. Now, what, there are these two different ways of doing this. And I can say something about, about why, why it matters. So the strong form has a nice property here. And the, the nice property of the strong form is that if, Suppose you had a system with fluxes that didn't depend on space at all, then this derivative, um, this derivative would drop out to zero and, and be identically zero. But that's not necessarily the case um, in, the, in the weak form. But the weak form, the, the, there's a disadvantage here. It turns out that if you use this form of the equations, I'm not gonna show this, but it turns out that um, the, the, how well the conservation law is satisfied is, is it's not necessarily always round up. So sometimes, there's uh, some people, for some, uh, some, some cases, people would prefer the weak form or the strong form. In practice, we've been using the strong form mostly in Spectre, um, but there's no reason you couldn't use the weak form. We haven't, we haven't tried it yet. And in fact, I'm going to be focusing my attention mostly on the binary black hole case. And in the binary black hole case, there are no flux terms because it's vacuum. And, and these terms only show up when you're doing like hydrodynamics or something where you have to write it in this conservative form. So there's no difference between the weak form and the strong form if the fluxes are zero. Because the only difference is, is this term here so that this is here, or is there this extra integral with the derivatives on the basis functions here? And if those Fs are zero, these are the same. And so I'm not gonna worry about this difference from now on yet. So what about the flux of gravitational waves from one element to the other? You can compute the flux of gravitational waves um, from the variables. The variables themselves are allowed to be discontinuous, but the flow of information as characterized by the characteristic fields is, is set so that information that leaves one element enters the other. So um, if you're going to compute the gravitational waves, then... I mean, they're built from the variables. So in principle, they could have differences from one element to the other that converge away. Um, but whatever part of them is connected to the characteristic fields, those still satisfy what leaves one element enters the other. I'm not sure I can give you a better answer than that. This term here, yes. So that's what I wrote right, right here. So if the interior and exterior are equal, the values on both sides of the boundary are the same, which they are within the limit of infinite resolution, then this term goes to zero, just like the G goes back to what was there before. But there was no D until I said, oh, I've got to account for possible discontinuities. And so, and so this term doesn't reduce to like a flux or something, it reduces to nothing in the infinite in the infinite resolution limit. That's right. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I mostly do the vacuum side, so I don't have as deep an insight as some other people might about the trade-offs of these different forms. Um, I know that in engineering, they like the weak form a lot. They like having the derivatives on the basis functions and not on the, the flux term. So like if they're doing like, I don't know, in engineering applications, like if you're doing fluid flow or something. Um, I think that when we've been looking at, at the, um, what we've been doing with, with Spectre so far is use the strong form, but I think it's a matter of preference more than uh, I mean, I, I don't have a good feeling yet, and I don't know if anyone in our collaboration does about which one of these would perform better in practice for the problems we're doing, because we haven't tried the weak form much yet. 
Um, so it's an interesting question. I wish I knew more, but I'm, I don't actually know very well because um, because this involves the just the, hyd the the matter terms that I don't spend most of my time thinking about. So I'm not as as sure about that. Um, but I know that uh, this form is more popular in in like engineering. So other questions? Yes. Uh, um, oh, this term, great question. Why does this, is this the interior? Because this term came from integrating this integral by parts. And this integral is over the interior. The only reason the neighbor entered at all was when we replaced this term in the surface integral with a numerical flux. And when we added this boundary correction for the non-conservative terms. So D and G are the only times where we said, okay, for our numerical method, we need to account for these discontinuities. So we're gonna change things and put in some kind of a function that can depend on things on both sides. But um, this term here is just, um, is just the surface term you get from undoing integration by parts of, of this integral here. And this integral doesn't make any reference to the interior or exterior. And we're not doing any kind of numerical replacements of things here. So that's why this one, that, so that's why this one is only on the interior because it's coming from an integral only on the interior. Does that, does that kind of make sense? Okay. So almost there. So what we've done is we've recast the equations in a form where we've got a volume integral and we've got a surface integral. And some of the things in here um, take care of possible uh, numerical errors that lead to little discontinuities at the boundaries of the, of the elements. So now to finish the spatial discretization, the last step is to come all the way back here to the spatial expansion, to the spectral expansion. Now we're going to introduce, uh, we're, we're going to expand every term in the equations. So the notation that I'm going to use here is like this. U alpha is equal to a sum from J breve equals zero. Now this could, this is exactly true if I went to infinity, but I'm gonna, here is where I'm gonna make an approximation by only summing to a finite number of terms. I'm gonna truncate the series and that will lead to a numerical error called trunc truncation error. And this is going to be um, U J breve alpha, which is the spectral coefficient times whatever this basis function is. It depends on space. I haven't said what it is yet. I just said there's N of them. And I'm going to write this as just U J breve alpha phi J breve. And since this index is repeated, the summation is implied. So when I'm about to rewrite the equation, I'm going to expand every single one of these terms in terms of coefficients like this times basis functions, but I'm not gonna keep writing the summation because that's too much. Okay, so step five is spectral expansion. spectrally expand everything, insert that. So what are we gonna get here? I'll draw a little line here so we can keep these equations separate. Zero is going to be equal to, and now what's gonna happen? Well, let's think about the time derivative term first. Integral d cubed x over the volume of the element omega k. Now we already had a basis function that we multiplied everything by here. And let's say if we just had the time derivative term, then we would get partial t. And now this sum u alpha is going to become uj, uj breathe alpha times phi j. And now here's the thing. Are the basis functions, do they depend on, let me ask you a couple of questions. Just call out yes or no. Do the basis functions depend on space? Yes or no? Yes. Do they depend on time? No, they're just, you know, ultimately they come from polynomials or something. They don't depend on time. So I can pull that phi j through the time derivative, right? So I'm gonna put, so I'm gonna put the phi j 
over there instead. Okay. All right, so that's the first term. And remember, there's a summation over the repeated J index implied here because I'm expanding this term out. So there's actually a whole bunch of, of terms here. Okay, we're gonna do the same thing for the flux. This is the flux term, partial I, F, I, alpha, beta. Um, so I'm gonna just call that whole thing J brief. This is the spectral coefficient of that. And then it would get multiplied by phi J and then you've summed over all of them. Okay, so there's the flux term. And then, we have the non-conservative term, bi alpha beta, partial i u beta. So we are summing over beta in here. And this whole thing will expand in terms of the basis functions. So here's the spectral coefficient times the phi j, add them up. And then we'll also basis expand the source terms. All right. And now we'll do the same thing for the flux term, partial omega k. And I'm doing this with the strong form. You could, you could do the same thing with the weak form. Since that's the one we're using, I, I'm gonna stick with, with that one. Okay. And then this integral is going to be d squared x over the surface. There was already a phi brief i in there. And now we're gonna series expand everything. Uh, so there will be a term like, well, a series expand the G, G, J, uh, J brief alpha, and that would be multiplied by phi brief J, but I'm going to move the phi brief J over here. And then this thing here, and interior I, F interior I alpha, um, this thing that's left over. Um, also, we'll series expand, multiply that times each basis function phi brief j, then sum over them all. And then we'll do the same thing for the non-conservative boundary correction, dj brief alpha. Okay. So this strong form of the equations, once I make this kind of approximation for each term in here and expand them all in terms of the basis functions, um, I can pull the basis functions together over here. Now I have a question for you to vote on in a minute, but first, are there any questions about this last step that I just did? If not, then this is gonna be a yes, no voting question. And the question is, do any terms in the square brackets depend on space? So that means either psi i or depend if you've gone through this coordinate mapping, the x's. Do any of the terms, any of the terms in the square brackets depend on space? So let's think about that for a bit and then we'll have a vote. Okay, would anyone like more time to think? If not, prepare your votes and hold up your votes. There was a split decision. Put your votes down, convince each other why you're right, and make sure if you both agree, you're not both wrong. And we'll vote again in about a minute. Okay, I heard some good discussion, but let's come back together and see if the class comes to a consensus or not. Prepare your votes again and hold up your votes again. 
Okay. okay. Thank you. Put your votes down. There was a nice shift in the right direction, but there's still a lot of disagreement on this question. So let's come back to a let's come back to a, a, a simpler example, and then we'll come back to the voting question itself. Let's look at this formula right here for u alpha. Let's look at each term. Okay, first of all, is u alpha itself allowed to depend on space? Yes, okay, not a trick question. Yes, it, it can. How about the phi? Is the phi allowed to depend on space? Yes, those are the basis functions. What about the uh, spectral uh, expansion coefficient, the u j breve alpha? Does that depend on space? No, those are numbers. You, those are numbers and the spatial dependence is captured in the basis functions. That's the idea of the spectral expansion. So like if you just had the first couple polynomials and you were writing U alpha equals, you know, U zero plus U one X, for instance, this might be your phi one and, the, and one might be your phi zero, for instance. Those are allowed to depend on space, but the coefficients in the series expansion don't. Those are the, and these are the things that in some sense that, that you're solving for in your numerical equation, because you know what the spatial dependence of the basis functions is. And so that is the key to answering this voting question. Every single term in here, is a spectral coefficient. They're the coefficients of the spectral expansion of one of these terms, of the U alphas, of the fluxes, of the sources, or of the non-conservative boundary terms, or these boundary non-conservative terms, or these boundary terms. Each one of these things is just the spectral expansion. The basis function that you multiply these coefficients by and add up to get the actual function, I factored out in both cases. The, the spatial dependence is only in these phi's. So the correct answer to this question was in fact B. There is no spatial dependence in the square brackets. You can evaluate this. You can evaluate the spatial derivatives using derivative matrices. It's just a matrix multiplication, just like what Harold was showing this morning. And every other term in here, like combining the B's with these, you're just doing matrix multiplication. You're, there's, no, there's no spatial dependence. These are just coefficients. As a result, these integrals are now things we know how to evaluate because we know what the basis functions are, and they are the only places that depend on where you are. So you can think of, so the spatial dependence is entirely here in these things in the yellow box. This is where the spatial dependence is. Just to unpack it a little bit, let's think about this one term, this term right here. What this really came from is I multiplied this by the phi j's, g j breve alpha, phi j breve, and this phi j breve depends on say x i, I'll put the explicit dependence back in, and then I'll put the explicit uh, su summation back in. This doesn't depend on space, but this does. And in each of these terms, I factored out the spatial dependence into these yellow boxes. So now, so now all the spatial dependence is here. Are there any questions about why this was B and not A? If not, so let me say something about these. This matrix has a name, this has a name. This is called the mass matrix, M, I breathe, J breathe. This is the mass matrix. And this is a surface integral that's also, it's a matrix in the sense that it's got these two indices that tell you which basis functions you're talking about. So for every different pair of these basis functions, there's this mass matrix and you could call this I don't know, L, I, J, maybe. I don't know if there's a standard, necessarily a standard name for that one. But the point is, if you know what basis functions you chose, you can just compute these integrals once and for all. And that is how we got rid of the spatial dependence. Because once you evaluate the integrals in the yellow boxes, the stuff in the square brackets is just stuff you're doing with matrix multiplication 
including differentiation matrices like you met this morning, but, but, that, but now the only derivative remaining is the time derivative. There is the spatial derivative, but you'll evaluate the spatial derivative using a differentiation matrix and turn it back into, um, and turn it back into uh, an algebra, uh, a matrix multiplication problem. So this term here, you can evaluate all these spatial derivatives with differentiation matrices. Just like what Harold showed you with the Chebyshev polynomials this morning, depending on what your basis functions are, exactly what those matrices are might be different, but you can get rid of these spatial derivatives and evaluate them once you, now that you've done the spectral expansion. And so that is how you get rid of the spatial dependence and do the spatial discretization. It's discrete because there's a finite number of terms in the sum and the, the, the derivative matrices that come from your choice of basis functions, um, or equivalently, you could think of it as just, hey, I know what this basis function is. So every time I see a spatial derivative, you know, you, you, you could just evaluate. But here, I've sort of assumed you've already computed this, the, the derivative using these differentiation matrices, and then you've expanded that in terms of your basis functions. So I can factor everything out. So that's the idea of the discontinuous of the discontinuous Glurkin way of doing things. You end up having volume terms, which get multiplied by this mass matrix. And these are evaluated on each element. I only derived it for the kth element, but you would do this for every single element. And then there's the surface integral. And because the surface integral can involve things from the neighbor, this is where communication happens. So if you want to parallelize this algorithm, then, you could imagine parallelizing by element and each element just has, every time you want to, uh, each element has some matrix operations you do every time you want to evaluate the coefficient of the mass matrix or the coefficient of the surface integral. Those surface integrals are things you can just do once you know what your basis functions are. And then since this only depends on time, you can tackle what remains as an ordinary differential equation system. So you could use time-stepping methods like, um, like you could use a Runga Kutta time stepper if you wanted to. So, so the spatial stuff is taken care of, you're left with time derivatives and you can use your favorite way of doing an integrate, integrating ODEs. Any questions about any of the discontinuous Glurkin stuff we were talking about? What does the mass matrix what, what is the mass matrix? Yeah. Yeah, so this just denotes what's happening in the element, not at the boundary. So all this stuff over here tells you what happens in space, and then this term takes care of what's happening at the interfaces between the, the elements. So the, the top row, it tells you what happens in all of these, and then the, the surface integral controls what's happening across their intersection. Other questions? Uh, interesting question. In fact, that was a voting question I was about to ask everyone. So rather than answer you right away, I'm going to ask you all to think about this. So I'm going to say my last, I guess I'm not supposed to go too far that way, but I'll say here, if, well, I haven't said what phi brief i and phi brief j are. Now you asked if they're Fourier, but let's say there are any, any uh, two functions that are orthogonal. And the question is, is that volume integral omega k d cubed x phi i breathe phi j breathe equal to zero? And we use a is yes and b is no. So the question is, if these are orthogonal, does this integral, well, not does it vanish, if they're orthogonal, does it equal um, delta ij? Because of course, if they're the same, it's not vanish. So if these are orthogonal, does this, does, does this thing equal the Kronecker delta or not if the basis functions are orthogonal? I'll let you think about that for a bit and then we'll vote. Thank you. 
unless anyone wants more time to think, let's prepare your votes and hold up your votes. Uh huh. Put your votes down. There was a 50-50 split, so convince someone near you in the next minute while you're right, and we'll see if the class agrees or remains polarized. I heard some good discussions, but we're almost out of time. I don't want to keep you from lunch. So let's prepare your votes one more time and hold up your votes and see what the consensus the class came to. Okay. Go ahead and put your votes down. There are two camps, a yes camp and a no camp on this one. It was almost evenly split. Now, let's talk about this. The secret to answering this question, if phi I breathe and phi J breathe are orthogonal functions, is this integral zero, the key is in this term right here, in this thing right here. D cubed X. Now, let me ask you this. Let's come back over to this picture here. What kind of a coordinate is X? Is X describing where you are in one of these deformed, cube, deformed cubes or in the logical cube? The deformed cube. But if you're going to introduce basis functions that are, say, orthogonal polynomials, like Chebyshev polynomials going from minus one to one, where would those polynomials be defined to be orthogonal on? What space do they live in? Logical. So the polynomials, the basis functions live here. So if you want to evaluate an integral like this, and we'll just go over here, if you want to evaluate this, and use orthogonality, what you have to do is integrate over the element and change variables to d cubed uh, psi, to the logical coordinates. And when you do that, you will pick up a determinant of a, of the, of a Jacobian, of, of some Jac Jacobian term. And I'll just write that as j times phi breve i phi breve j. Now, if it turns out that your cube, that if, you, if it turns out that you chose a domain where instead of doing a sphere, you're really integrating over a, a cube from minus one to one, then this, then this Jacobian would be an identity matrix, its determinant would be one, and then when you evaluate this thing, you would get the Kronecker delta. But if, this, if that's not the case, and this Jacobian has a determinant that isn't one, or isn't a constant, so that you didn't just say, stretch your cube into some, some kind of a brick, but you actually changed its shape like over there, then that uh, will break, the, the spatial dependence of the Jacobian will break the, the integral always uh, being the Kronecker delta. So the correct answer to this question in general is actually no, because of the Jacobian that comes in when you change variables to actually integrate in the logical space. So I've been carrying those DXs around the whole time, but when you actually want to integrate using these basis functions, you've got to change variables to the logical frame where they're defined if you want to use their orthogonality properties. Questions? Yes. 
Yeah. So you could imagine to find them in the physical space, you, they're not going to be Legendre polynomials or Chebyshev polynomials because all their nice properties go from minus one to one and your physical space probably doesn't. You could imagine doing something like that, but it's not obvious to me that you could always do it with uh, functions that are orthogonal over whatever the domain you defined it is. In general, you'll have these Jacobians showing up. But maybe if your real space is just like, all you did was take the cube <clears throat> and stretch it into some kind of a rectangle, well then the Jacobians determine it would be a constant. It wouldn't depend on where you are and you could factor it out of the integral and then it would still go to zero if the functions were orthogonal anyway. How are the expansion coefficients evaluated? Um, in order to get into the details of that, you would do something very similar to what you saw with the Chebyshev stuff this morning. And we actually use Legendre polynomials instead. If I have time, I'll show you how it works, but it's the same idea. Um, basically, you'll know what the function is at certain grid points, and that knowledge will be equivalent to knowing the values of the expansion coefficients. And there's some, there's some formula you can do where um, if you know what the expansion coefficients are, you can plug them in and evaluate the function. So it's, it's it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, yeah, ultimately, when you're doing all these things, it starts in the logical cube, and then you take the result and map it back to the, to the physical frame. So you do everything on the logical cube, and then each grid point on the logical cube it might be like a Legendre Gauss Lobato grid point or something. I'll say more about that if there's time uh, later on this week. Then that grid point just moves to some place in the physical frame. But yeah, I think uh, I think I would think of it as fundamentally you're doing stuff in the logical frame. Okay, so tomorrow, what I want to tell you about next is what do we choose for this D? And if there's time, I might say something about what we choose for the G, but um, not very much because I'm 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 just for lack of time and my expertise, I'm focusing more on the general relativity side where the D is important and there's, there's no G because there's no fluxes. So I'm gonna tell you about this. And to do that, I'm gonna to have to introduce this idea of characteristic fields and characteristic speeds. And maybe Harold's gonna beat me to it tomorrow morning, we'll see, but that's the, that's the plan. And then um, if there's time left over, I can say something about how the Legendre polynomials are different from the uh, Chebyshev polynomials that, that you've already met. So thanks very much for, for participating and I hope you all have a nice lunch. <laughs>